Okay, uh, maybe we can start. And uh, it's our great pleasure to have our first TAAC distinguished lecturer here and uh, today. And uh, we are very kind of uh, honored to have uh, Dr. Huang here. And uh, uh, before that, okay, uh, our uh, TAAC president, uh, Professor Wang, will give a welcome uh, kind of uh, uh, talk, okay. Thank you, Ju. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining our first distinguished lecture series. Um, before we start today's lecture, let me briefly introduce what TAC is. So TAC stands for Tsinghua Alumni Academic Club. So this is a nonprofit academic organization registered in the United States. Uh, TAC aims at enhancing communications and interactions among its members and the collaborators and promoting excellence in research and ed education for the benefit of the society. Uh, its members are Tsinghua alumni. Um, for those who hold uh, official full-time appointments as a tenure track or tenured faculty member or officially retired from tenured faculty positions in higher education institutions in North America. Uh, Tech currently has approximately 700 members, including some National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and the Medicine members distinguished members and the fellows of professional organizations. Uh, as Professor Han just mentioned, so today is our first lecture for the distinguished lecture series. Uh, so this is because uh, tech feels the need to promote new knowledge, research findings, education, and workforce uh, development through such a distinguished lecture series. Um, we're honored to have Dr. Uh, Xue Dong Huang, uh, an advisor of TAC, to be our first speaker. Our distinguished lecture series task force includes professors Zhu Han, Xiao Peng Li, and uh, Chen, uh, Han Chen. They worked very hard to make today's lecture happen. Uh, we appreciate their effort. Now I would like to pass the microphone to our moderator, uh, Professor Zhu Han at the University of Houston. He's Vice President for External Affairs at TAC. Do please start. Okay, uh, yeah, I think first uh, let me uh, introduce our distinguished speaker. And uh, Dr. Uh, Xue Dunghuang is a Microsoft uh, Technical Fellow and uh, AICTO. Uh, in 1993, Dr. Huang left Carnegie Mellon to found the Microsoft Speech Technology Group. Dr. Huang had been leading Microsoft's spoken language effort for three decades. In addition to bring speech to the massive market, Dr. Huang has a light edge or cognitive service in achieving several historical human, uh, human parity milestones in speech recognition, machine translation, and the computer region. He led other uh, cognitive service from its inception, including Azure Open Speech, Computer Region, and the Language Service, to making Azure AI a leading platform. Dr. Huang holds more than 170 US patents and has published over 100 papers and two books. And uh, Dr. Huang is an IEEE fellow and ACM fellow. And uh, Dr. Huang is, uh, was elected to the member of the National Academy of Engineering and uh, American Academic and Art and Science. As far as I, uh, we know that, okay, this is the first of mainland educated uh, uh, scholar to win the uh, two academic members. And uh, Dr. Huang received uh, his bachelor degree from Hunan University, master degree from the Tsinghua University, you can see the background, and uh, PhD, uh, PhD from the University of Edinburgh. And uh, without further introduction, let's welcome Dr. Huang. All right, thank you, Professor Han. Um, this is a great opportunity for me to share the journey we have in the last uh, 40 years. So uh, the title of my talk is really a journey toward a more integrated AI. Um, you can see also from this photo, I happen to find the, the photo I had uh, 40 years ago. And this was taken when I was a graduate student in the Tsinghua working on speech and AI. So it's amazing that uh, I, I couldn't find the photo 
that was taken on May 2nd. So this was the only one I had on May 1st. That was the holiday, as most people know. So in this talk, I will share the journey we went through in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And I hope this is a great um, story to celebrate Tsinghua's anniversary. Um, so let me start. So sure, please. I have uh, spent, uh, you know, half of my life associated with four beautiful universities. I'm forever indebted to the four great schools. Um, I spent five years in Tsinghua. I didn't finish my PhD um, and went to Edinburgh, got my PhD there, and then did my postdoc in the CMU, and then became faculty member. And eventually I got uh, recruited by Microsoft. I spent the second half of my life in one company. So my life is pretty simple and straightforward. Um, so just to really share my personal journey, I think it is probably helpful is in one slide, what did I do in the last 30 years in one company? So uh, this slide summarizes what I've done. Um, first, I helped to fund the Microsoft Speech Program and we launched uh, the first API for Windows 95. That was really, you know, with the same goal, just like what we have today in Azure Cognitive Services or OpenAI services to enable developers to really take advantage of the artificial intelligence. So the, the speech API was Microsoft's first AI API at that time. Um, then, we moved on from the client-based, PC-based AI services to the cloud-based services. We launched uh, Project Oxford. I'll talk a little bit more in 2015. That's just really reflected the, the change of the industry from PC-centric to the cloud-centric. And then I helped to really drive the more integrated AI, not just on speech, but also language and computer vision. So that will provide the, the services to enable people to, to do more, to enhance productivity in a more integrated fashion. So that's essentially what I have done in the last 30 years in one company. Of course, Microsoft is a big company. They have all kinds of different teams from application to platform, to hardware, to research. I went through almost all of them um, in, in, in the last 30 years. So in today's talk, what I want to do is really talk about the industrial revolution that is coming. And it is really just driving the society moving forward. This is the slide that illustrated the GDP associated with the technology and the industrial revolution. Of course, the printing press that started uh, to bring Europe from the dark age that triggered the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. The steam engine that happened to be invented by a Scottish person, his name is called Watt, started a, a major industrial revolution for the whole world. Then after that, you can see the, the GDP growth with uh, electricity, telegraph, and this, uh, you know, massive industrial revolution that changed everything we experienced. More recently, the PC, internet, and smartphone really changed and accelerated the, the growth for the whole world, whether it's in China, Europe, or the US. Everyone can feel the power of the web, the smartphone, and the cloud. So the next big driving force clearly, unquestionably is AI. So it's an exciting time for all of us. We're just at the beginning of the next industrial revolution. So this is the context why I want to use this event to share the excitement and the journey. So at Microsoft, we have the production services, AI services that is broadly available 
for everyone in the world, whether you are in China or Africa or Europe. You can access Azure Cognitive Services that represent the best AI services from Microsoft and our partners. So we cover the computer vision services in the form of API. You can easily access, you pay based on the services fee. We have the unmatched speech services for both recognition and the synthesis. We have language services and the decision. And uh, we also partner with OpenAI, we create Azure OpenAI services that included uh, you know, chat GPT, DALI, and uh, GPT 4.0, the latest, greatest from our partner. All of those services are running on Azure cloud infrastructure. Um, it provides a consistent, secure, um, data safe services for enterprise customers. So um, even the open AI services are not available in China, but Azure open AI services are available in China for our customers, just like our commitment to serve everyone and every organization on this planet, no matter where they are. So this is the pro product form that I helped to create from launching that in 2015, codenamed Project Oxford to production, to becoming gross margin positive as a profitable business and to help everyone enhance the productivity. It's a great journey in the last uh, few years. Now, just I want to really come back to reflect and share how did we do this in our journey? So this slide illustrated the Microsoft AI milestones from 2016 to 2021. You can see Microsoft together with many industry partners, we created many human parity milestones. Basically the AI services reach the same level as humans if the cost is not a concern. But among all those services, Microsoft uses specialized AI models. It's not really one generic model that can do all of them. Um, so this started from 2016. We have achieved the human parity milestone and the open research benchmark from speech recognition to machine translation to computer vision to natural language processing. So those are all fantastic, um, but they are one specialized model that actually did all those work. Most recently in 2022, it's uh, exciting to see one unified language model called ChatGPT or GBT from OpenAI, our partner, that reached a uh, you know, amazing, amazing response. Um, this one illustrated the massive progress. So basically we measured the time to reach 100 million users. It took about uh, 16 years for mobile phones to reach 100 million active users. For the internet, because it's a new technology, it accelerates adoption, it, uh, it took seven years. So the application of the internet such as Facebook, because you already got the web and it's even faster, four and a half years. But the most importantly, for ChatGPT, it broke the record. It took three months reaching 100 million users. So that's a really a phenomenal result just from this historical perspective, right? So why this is the case? That's because using one unified model, they can achieve a lot of human parity tasks, regardless what it is. Let's take one of the most challenging one, the bar exam. Here, you can see from the right, you have, you know, human, most of students. That's the average score, 68. That's the human's level. This is considered as some of the most challenging tasks. So when we work with open on GPT-3, 3.5, and I personally was not that impressed. It was expensive, and in comparison to the existing cost-effective cost model, it was good, but wasn't 
that impressive given the quality and the cost ratio. But what changed my personal opinion was GPT-4. You can see, even on one of the most challenging tasks without really doing anything, it could outperform average students taking the same exam. So this is the reason why you got the 100 million users rushing to play with it in three months. So did we solve the problem? Um, so yes, we didn't solve the, no, yes or no, depends on how you want to use it. So I asked this question, um, like uh, what is Azure Cognitive Services Z code and the holistic representation towards integrated AI? Of course, that, that's what I'm going to share the journey, you know, the story with all of you, but the, you can see, what the OpenAI very confidently telling me, sorry, but to my knowledge, there's no such, such, such a thing called Azure Cognitive Services Z code. And then they did a good job to explain what our holistic representation and um, integrative AI stories was Microsoft approach emphasizing the integration of different AI services, such as computer vision, natural language processing, and the speech recognition. That to represent the three most important pillar. On top of that, they talk about the, the ethical consideration in the development and the deployment of AI systems. Of course, Microsoft has established ethical principles for AI that prioritize fairness, reliability, privacy, inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability. It's amazing. ChatGPT explained everything well. So it's both plus and minus. It's not perfect. If we do a simple Bing search, actually you can see the top line answer is the new Z code based translation model is now available is in production system that everyone can use to translate uh, you know, your text among 150 languages serving customers worldwide. So you can see the sharp contrast between the reliable services from ChatGPT that often get something um, off the chart versus the existing search services. So they are still unsolved the technical issues for us to overcome. That's the high level story. Now I want to drill down a little bit more to share the story, how Microsoft did the journey of pushing integrative AI. As I talked, we launched the speech API in 1995. Um, 20 years after that, we launched the project at Oxford. That's essentially the code name for Azure Cognitive Services. This is a service that included a speech language and the computer vision. Um, that is the journey reflect the industrial paradigm shift from PC centric to cloud centric. And uh, AI of, of course in the last 20 years has advanced so much to be a much better tool in comparison to what we had in 1995. So this is the roadmap um, about how Microsoft pushed the integrative AI. I published the blog um, three years ago. This is one you can find on the website. Essentially, there are two theses. Number one is really, we want to look into the intersection of three most important dimensions. The first one is the language, text. That's the text. And because there are 7,000 languages spoken on this planet, just working on English is not enough. The transfer learning is very important. So we emphasize multilingual aspect. We want to have 
200 or 300 languages supported. So we can serve most of the people on the planet extremely well. So that's the, what we call Z dimension. So just to have the text and the multilingual capability still not enough. Today in the meeting, I'm having a conversation with you. You can see my video. So we want to have the sensory that got both audio and video. We believe that intersection is going to be very important to have the representation, to have the intelligence. So the second thesis was such a foundation model need to be augmented beyond the self-attention based transformer. That's why we got a second point. And this is the first point. The second point is you need to ground attention infused with external knowledge. So based on those, we believe that the whole society can move forward. And the uh, chat GPT or GPT-4 is moving closer to that vision. And um, we have the ability to deal with not only English, but also many other languages. So X and Z dimension got covered. Now OpenAI is adding the video and the com computer vision capability, it's coming. Um, so we, we can see that the, the vision I outlined more than three years ago is clearly becoming time tested and the reality. Now, because of the shared vision, I want to drill down further into the three pillars on speech, language, and uh, computer vision to explain how we did what we did. So the economist got a, um, a very good historical story about the speech and the language. So I would say, you know, this was um, probably one of the best summary. I'm still using the same thing to explain what we have done. <clears throat> I want to highlight that the machine translation is really one of the best workload to drive AI progress. We should just really recognize the, the importance and what IBM has done. So they started working on translation since 1954 and that being Watson Research. Um, their speech group also started the hidden marker model statistic-based approach together with Carnegie Mellon, Jim Baker, and uh, he did his PhD thesis for hidden marker model based speech recognition and funded the, the company called the Dragon. So they really pioneered statistic-based AI that changed from the rule-based AI into Hit the Marco model base. <clears throat> it was the same IBM speech group that uh, expanded the speech method into machine translation and popularized statistical machine translation. So then eventually the speech people worked with Jeff Hinton and Microsoft, demonstrated that deep learning could also further improve hidden marker model based approach. Then the same thing expanded into machine translation. Eventually Google invented a transformer to outperform LSTM based neural machine translation. That really became the foundation of everything we have today. So the foundation model was coined by Stanford professor, but Microsoft has been shipping unified speech model. We didn't call that foundation model since 2017. So it's already in production with fine tuning in Azure Cognitive Services. You can see all those learning from speech and translation got uh, really popularized and expanded to other AI problems. So where did we stand <clears throat> on speech recognition for the commercial AI quality. Stanford did the AI index in 2021. They talked about unsolved challenges. Basically what they have done is using commercial speech recognition APIs from Microsoft, Amazon, Google, IBM, and Apple. They 
transcribed the interview they had with black speakers and the white speakers. Um, to everyone's surprise, there was a big gap on the performance. Here, the y-axis is the Arabic, the lower the better. So you can see, regardless if the API is from Microsoft or from Apple, there's always a gap between the black and the white. This was a huge ethical issue and the challenges about the inclusiveness. Um, New York Times even had a cover story about the, the Stanford AI study. So the, 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 the real story behind this is actually very straightforward. The reason is that the black speakers got the 10% of the population in the country. When you collect a, you know, a lot of data blindly, the representative data from black speakers with strong accent is small. Therefore, the quality is small. AI reflected the data people used to learn. Um, <clears throat> the report was published in 2021. I'm happily telling you, if Stanford is measuring IGO speech today, in 2023, the quality would have been here. Of course, the wide speaker is also getting lower. So Microsoft is pushing the air quality for the matched stat status for broad uh, custom base. Um, even, even though we have the lowest error rate, the gap is also the smallest. Today, we continuously push the quality improvement because of the amazing teams we have. So that is the, the data point I want to just highlight on, on matched Microsoft AI quality in speech recognition. That's the story. You know, it's really the data and the relentless push on the quality. So most recently, OpenAI also open source their Whisper. So a lot of people benchmarked Whisper, which is uh, <clears throat> other production services. And there was a startup called Speechmatics from the UK. They published a paper. This is from the blog they have. They talk about the Speechmatics. If they use a large, massive model, they can further reduce the error rate. So there was a, um, one dimension they didn't talk about what is the cost of serving to transcribe one novel speech. So you cannot just only measure the error rate. I'm happy Microsoft, no matter how you measure, turned out to be number one or number two. But here in this case, I want to really just give you a, a benchmark. Microsoft and the OpenAI Whisper, even though the error rate, they are similar, but the cost of serving Microsoft Azure Speech API is far, far more efficient. So. That's the dimension most people didn't measure when they talk about the quality. Those are all production system. So I bet they are cost of serving is similar, but the whisper is an open source. We can take that whisper model and host ourselves. It turned out to be far more expensive if we have to host the, the services from OpenAI. So the, the lesson I want to share with all of you is really when you drive the AI production for broad customers, you have to optimize both the quality and the serving cost. That's also a typical computer science constraint, performance and the, at the cost, you have the balance. So Microsoft Azure Content for Services worked impressively to balance, to provide the, not only the best quality, also the most efficient services in the industry today and we support 150 languages, it's pretty straightforward to adopt and easy to use. So now I want to peel the awning a little bit more, <laughs> explain behind the scene, how did we do what we did? So before I came to Microsoft, and I was on the faculty on the CMU, just like all of you in the tech, and I was um, seeking Funding. So this was the proposal I wrote 
to the National Science Foundation. This, this, this proposal was actually on the web, <laughs> reflected the, the desire. I wanted to really unify the language model and the acoustic model. By the way, the language model is what is being used in ChatGPT, the large language model. It's just the language model is getting larger. The whole notion of language model started from IBM speech. And uh, at that time, because of the con constraint of the computing, we use only n-gram. Basically, we look at the last n words and predict the probability of the next word. Today, we are looking at the, a few thousand tokens. We predict the next word. Essentially, it's the same notion. Even the history of word sequences, you want to find out what is the probability of the next word. So the proposal I had at that time was really to use neural nets, deep learning, to unify both language model and acoustic model. And it's amazing, 30 years after that, that is precisely the modern architecture we're using today. And what is even more exciting, the unified transformer can even actually go beyond speech recognition to include translation as well. So I want to show you a demo of multilingual speech recognition and the translation. So it's essentially multi-language in and the multi-language out. Hi, I'm Laura. Nice to meet you. In this series, we're going to learn basic German expressions. It's super easy and it only takes three minutes. In this lesson, we are going to learn how to introduce ourselves in German. We'll start speaking right away, but first, it's important to clarify that in German there is a difference between the formal and the informal language. Let's first see how German people introduce themselves in an informal situation. Hallo, ich heiße Laura. Schön, dich kennenzulernen. Hi, I'm Laura. Nice to meet you. Hallo, ich heiße Laura. Schön, dich kennenzulernen. Start by saying, hallo, ich heiße, then say your name. Hallo, ich heiße Laura. Finally say, schön, dich kennenzulernen. Hallo, ich heiße Laura. Schön, dich kennenzulernen. And now, let's see the same sentence in formal speech. Guten Tag, ich heiße Laura Meyer. Schön, Sie kennenzulernen. Good day, I'm Laura Meyer. Nice to meet you. Guten Tag, ich heiße Laura Meyer. Schön, Sie kennenzulernen. So you got an idea. So that is really a high level, very fast uh, and the brief introduction, how we did achieve unmatched quality on speech recognition. So the next one I want to share with you is um, on synthesis. This one is probably um, unaware for most of the people. So I want to share with you for BBC, when they broadcast using news anchor person, that's what you hear. You can ask me for BBC radio stations and podcasts or an update. But if the person is sick, BBC could easily adopt them. The people with hidden immunity against COVID-19. While the latest research suggests that antibodies against COVID-19 could be lost in just three months, a new hope has appeared on the this horizon. The ending to help people would wipe. So that's a high level summary of the speech. Now, let me come to the second pillar, natural language processing. Of course, the most famous one is the chat GPT. We shipped Azure OpenAI services last year. This is part of a cognitive services um, with the model coming from OpenAI, whether it's chat GPT, GPT-4, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, DALI, they are broadly available. So we're providing this API services to light up a wide range of services from both Microsoft and our customers outside of Microsoft. So I'm not going to really explain how great a chat GPT is. I want to use this example to really highlight how we can federate GPT, which is very expensive, with a smaller model, which is very efficient, but the quality may not be as good for some of the language pairs. So this is the federation about um, um, 
on language services for translation in cognitive services. So you, you can see different language pair. This is you know, the translation between German and English. The blue dot is GPT. The red one is Microsoft existing translation services as part of cognitive services. Um, the higher the quality, the, the higher the number, the better the quality. Um, so you can see the GPT, the blue line in general is uh, similar to a much less expensive translation API services for some of the smaller languages such as um, Czech. The existing production service is much better than GPT because GPT is great for the top tier languages, but not for the low resource languages. But what I want to highlight is really, you can actually have the GPT and the Microsoft specialized translation working together. With a federated approach, your cost is actually less than just using GPT for everything, because for the easy one, you can use specialized model only for the difficult, challenging tasks you back off to GPT. So the federated services is the, the line here. You can see the really actually offer the much better quality than GPT, or just use the, the cost efficient translation APIs. So the, the point I'm highlighting here is really, as we move forward, getting the GPT as the foundation model, you still need a lot of specialized AI. And with the federated system working together, you can go deep and provide cost-effective AI services to delight our customers. So this slide, just like that economist story on speech, illustrate uh, an amazing journey. And the corner here is the really the story about the translation. So in the 50s, it was mostly rule-based translation. And then IBM Speech Group moved from speech hidden marker model-based uh, recipe to translation, really revolutionized translation, lifted the quality substantially. That's what we call SMT. And after that, then people started using neural nets, deep learning for translation, then moved up the quality by another step function. Um, what is most exciting is the transformer with the attention model derived from Google translation team that essentially provided the modern recipe for everything. The chat GPT or GPT 4.0, the large language model derived from transformer essentially is a translation services to translate the historical data into predictive data. So basically you have, you know, you trend with a transformer, given the history, you want to predict what the future it is. So if you have the prompt, ask a question, the translation services provide the answer for you. This is why fundamentally it's almost super challenging to deal with hallucination because structurally, this is essentially trying to predict based on the historical data, based on all the data you have seen from the web, um, you self-translate yourself from one, one set of historical data to the answer you want. So those are the, some of the highlights. The first one is really um, IBM CMU started speech research the large language model was incorporated in, into that. Then they moved that large language model engram-based statistic approach to translation in the 90s. And Microsoft found that the speech could be modernized with deep learning with the help of Jeff Hinton. And then we also pushed that into the neural machine translation. Google created transformer that outperformed LSTM-based neural machine translation. That set the foundation for the modern large language model today. So 
this chart really illustrate this massive amount of large language models or the vision model, et cetera. So the size of the pie is uh, just the amount of data people use. And the model size is on the y axis. The x axis is the time. So start from 1950 all the way to 2023, you can see that the chat GPT is here. And the China got the actual Wudao is even bigger, but not necessarily provides better quality. Um, it's just amazing to see, you know, the diversity of creating this large language model. So GPT-3 is here. And there are also Google's pathway language model and the Facebook's Llama. They're all pretty impressive, similar in terms of um, the horsepower. But the chat GPT was fine-tuned specifically for conversation because they open I used a large amount of data that's suitable for the domain. But GPT-4, I cannot actually talk about that here, really provided another step function above GPT-3 or 3.5. 3.5 is here. So I cannot explain how they did it, but it's just, you know, in terms of quality, it's very impressive. <clears throat> the, the quote I have here, there's no data like more data was uh, from IBM speech group. When they used the massive amount of data to train the engram, they found that the more data they had, the better the quality that led to the head of the IBM speech group telling everyone, um, if they fire one linguist, they reduce error by X percent. Essentially, he just laughed about all those rule-based approach, knowledge-based approach. And he's crazy about just embracing data and the computing. This started in the 70s. So the imp impressive result of chat GPT is not a coincidence. It's um, you can trace back all the way to the speech research and translation research IBM started in the 70s. With remaining probably 10 minutes, I want to briefly summarize what we did on the computer vision. Um, before Microsoft launched the project Florence, um, every task of computer vision is kind of silo, specialized because Computer vision is very diverse. You have image classification, you have object detection, you have image captioning or segmentation. They're very different. So in the past, people use a separate model, collect the training data, create a model, fine tune, then provide API services. Um, so we decided to turn this into a horizontal play, create the foundation pre-trained model. We start this journey three years ago. And so we, that's why we call this project Flores, trying to bring the AI renaissance to computer vision, just like the other foundation model. So I'm happy to report, <clears throat> this is already in production for Azure Cognitive Network Services without increasing the cost. So I want to emphasize quality and the cost efficiency that the balance approach is always what we do in shipping our own APIs. So, Using one unified foundation model, we benchmark against 40 different uh, open benchmarks. We achieved the state of the art, the best of the best, when we actually launched uh, the paper last year. It took us a while to get this into production, so we are very happy. This is available as a preview in Azure Cognitive Services. So the most recent the economist had a story combining chat GPT with Florence, we're able to tell a story. So this is the, the story completely generated by AI. This just by looking at the cover story of the economist magazine, you can have uh, GPT telling you a story of what this is about. It's just amazing image captioning. So in March, we announced the public preview of the API. 
that is broadly available for anyone who wants to take advantage of the computer vision organization. So this is the, the I'm not going to run the demo. You can actually come to the website and play with it with a wide range of tasks from OCR to spatial analysis, image object detection, et cetera. So let me quickly close with uh, what I think the future of AI is going to be. Stanford University coined this foundation model in 2021. It's great. They have um, really outlined a beautiful vision similar to Microsoft holistic uh, representation and integrative AI. Um, bigger computer from the media, a lot of data, and how to customize. Those are the, you know, really the recipe for our success. So I want to play with this video to show off the exciting vision, how we can take advantage of Azure Cognitive Services and Azure OpenAI services together to delight office workers with Microsoft 365 Copilot. Thank you.